After finishing a movie, the popcorn bucket is empty, the credits are rolling, and perhaps it was one of those movies that we thought was leading us in one particular direction, but then there was that big twist at the end. Or, after finishing a book, a real page-turner, keeping us up late at night, past our bedtime, trying to figure it out, and then on that last page, we discover who did it. There is that tendency to go back to the beginning and to figure out what we missed along the way, trying to put all the pieces back together. Well, when we get to the end of Psalm 4, and it finally says, I will lie down and sleep in peace. We might have that tendency to go back to the beginning and see what we missed. Because at the outset of Psalm 4, there is this clear distress signal. Answer me, O God, when I call. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. That there is concern. There's a crisis. There is chaos. And yet, it ends with peace. At the very end of that road to Emmaus, the two disciples are somewhat startled to discover that the person who has been walking with them, the person who was explaining Scripture to them, the person who broke bread with them was Jesus. So they go back to the beginning of their journey in Jerusalem to see what they missed, to put all the pieces back together. And they find the 11 disciples trying to put all the pieces back together as well because they have heard the good news that the women brought to them from the tomb. And then Jesus appears startles them. They are terrified. They think he's a ghost. But Jesus says to them, peace be with you. That in going back to the beginning and in making sense of the end, Jesus offers a word of peace. Martin Copenhaver was the president of Andover Newton Theological Seminary, and he was a preacher's kid. And when his father passed away, he went back to the church that his father had served for 18 years, gathering with that family of faith for the funeral. The current pastor of the church spoke a wonderful homily, sharing the celebration of the wonderful years of service that his father had given that congregation, while many of his father's oldest friends told some wonderful stories that allowed people to smile and to laugh. And then after the final hymn, Copenhaver got up from the front pew and walked to the front of the sanctuary, turning around to look upon this group of people that he knew so well to offer the final words of benediction, words that would honor his father and bless the congregation, words that he had thought long and hard about what they should be. And he finally settled on Jesus' words from the Gospel of John. 
that he stood at the front of the sanctuary and said, Now, as we leave this place, let us leave with these words of our Lord Jesus, cleaving to our hearts. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. that when we try to put all the pieces together, we find a thread of peace running throughout all of Scripture that leads us to the very heart of God. That peace is something we yearn for. That peace is something the world needs. That peace is something we have been given. And God's peace is about wholeness. It's where everything is as it should be for us and for all creation. But the question remains. It lingers in the air as we think about the peace of God, that if we have been given peace, how are we to give it away to others? And it does not take very long in this life to discover how hard that is. There's that wonderful old parable told by many about two knights. They were brothers, the black knight and the white knight, and they both set out on the same morning on a quest, but they went in two different directions, only to meet in the darkness of the woods years later. And since it was so dark in those woods, They didn't recognize one another, so they assumed the other was an enemy, and they fought. And they fought until their final breath. And it was only then that they removed their helmets to discover that they were not enemies. They were brothers. And perhaps we all know that feeling of realizing that instead of fighting with someone, we should have been embracing them, that giving peace away is difficult. Mirosov Volf teaches theology at Yale Divinity School. He was born in Croatia, which was then a part of Yugoslavia. When he was five years old, he moved to Serbia, which was also a part of Yugoslavia at the time. And his father was a pastor. He was a preacher's kid. But in that communist setting, that made his family suspect, which shaped his childhood in many ways. In 1983, he was required to serve the military of Yugoslavia. It was not his choice, but he had to leave his wife and live on a military base for one year. And since his wife was an American, he was seen as suspect yet again that the military saw his wife as a potential CIA spy. And not only that, Volf had studied in the West, which made him further suspicious. So he always felt like people were watching him on the military base. And truth be told, most of his unit was spying on him. One day... A captain called him in for questioning. 
saying, we have proof that you're working for the other side. And they threatened him. They threatened his family. They charged him with treason. They did everything they could to force him to talk. And these interrogations kept happening over and over again. And even though he didn't have anything to confess, he was terrified. Finally, the interrogations stopped but not until they had taken their toll on him. And years later, he still finds himself thinking about those experiences and that fear and those wounds, and he wonders, how should he respond? Resentment? Anger, hate, forgiveness. He writes, To triumph fully, evil needs two victories, not one. The first victory happens when an evil deed is perpetrated. The second victory when evil is returned. After the first victory, evil would die if the second victory did not infuse it with new life. He decided he could not do anything about those who threatened him or spied on him but he could do something to prevent the second victory of evil. But it is easy to lose hope because of all of those first victories. So perhaps we can simply begin with small hope. That any time a child says, can I set up a lemonade stand at the front of the neighborhood because I want to raise money for the community market? We see small hope. Any time a friendship is restored where there is just a glimmer of a new beginning, we see small hope. Any time we muster up enough strength to pray not only for our friends, but also for those who have hurt us, we see small hope. And any time we see any level of effort to avoid the second victory of evil, We see small hope. And small hope is still hope. That deep down inside of us, and right there at the very heart of God, we find this longing for peace, for the end of conflict, for the end of violence, for the end of division. And it is, as Mother Teresa said, any act of love is the work of peace no matter how small. So since Jesus has left us with peace, let us allow God's peace to shape our thoughts, 
to shape our words and to shape our actions so that we just might give it away. Amen.